Hello again, Physics 30s. It's me, Mr. Jukley, and today we're going to talk about properties of the electron. Now, you already know these properties of the electron. Like, what's the charge of an electron? Yep, that's right. What's the mass of an electron? Uh-huh, uh-huh, absolutely. What's the charge to the mass ratio of an electron? Huh? That's a little bit trickier. We'll go through all of it today, right? We'll go through all of it, how exactly people found these things, not just people in general. These two people, J.J. Thompson, which we talked about recently in the Models of the Atom, and Robert Millikan, who seems to keep coming up in Physics 30. That Robert Millikan, hey? You almost think he should have a unit named after him with all the stuff he's done that we're learning about here. So... <clears throat> This comes after the old cathode ray tubes, uh, and the cathode rays were discovered, and people figured out that they were charged particles. Lots of scientists attempted to study it, and in particular, figure out its charge and its mass. Remember, cathode rays are electrons, by the way. This was accomplished by two scientists, Milken and Thompson. So in Thompson's experiment, he used a modified cathode ray tube to try and investigate the properties of an electron, a modified cathode ray tube. So here's what it looks like in a nutshell. So we've got an electron gun. That electron gun, it speeds electrons up from rest. So essentially it is parallel plates and electrons are accelerated across parallel plates. We've done stuff like that before. Then we've got deflection fields. We've got the charged particle moving through Let's see, we've got some parallel plates in here. So here's a parallel plate here, here's a parallel plate here. So a charged particle moving uh, perpendicular through an electric field. We've dealt with that in unit two. And let me just clean that up a little bit here. The other deflection field that we've got, looks like we've got some coils in here. Coils make solenoids, which create a magnetic field. We have got a charged particle moving through a perpendicular magnetic field. And then finally, we've got our fluorescent screen where the electrons smash into them and uh, we actually see the glowing where it smashes in. We've talked about that before in, uh, I think that was in Unit 2 we talked about that. So what do you notice about this? There's absolutely nothing new. It's just how we put it together or how Thompson put it together uh, that creates a new technology that will help us out with those... Uh, well, with the properties of an atom. Now, that's one thing I actually want to mention about this. There's literally nothing new in this lesson. It's just putting things together in a different way. So, just kind of thinking about the electron gun and how we could accelerate electrons from the cathode over to the anode. So, how do those speed up like crazy? Because um, we need them going really, really, really fast for this. And you know electrons typically go 10 to the power of 6, 10 to the power of 7 meters per second. So, two different ideas that we can look at for this. Physics principle 1 and physics principle 5. Now, physics principle 1 we talked about is a little bit limited for some things. Same with physics principle 5, a little bit limited for other things. So, if I'm dealing with... Uh, physics principle one, I'm dealing with net force is equal to mass times acceleration. Now the net force is my electric force, which is equal to mass times acceleration. And we remember that electric force is electric field times charge, which is equal to, again, mass times acceleration. And I'll just put this off to the side, just in case we got forgot. Electric field, if we ever wanted to calculate it for parallel plates, it's delta V, I screwed that up, delta V over D. So the potential difference divided by the distance, and remember it is uniform everywhere in those parallel plates. And then, so once we find the acceleration, we just look at our kinematics equations for acceleration, and we could figure out the final speed. Cool, so that's one way we could do it. The other way, and the and physics principle one is limited because, well, we need the distance, and for kinematics, things like time are important, right? So a lot of times we don't have those. Whereas physics principle five, we're dealing more with ETI equals ETF, and if the electron is starting from rest, all we've got is that electric potential energy, and if it accelerates too really, really, really fast on the other side, all we'll have on the other side is our kinetic energy, so delta V times Q 
is equal to 0.5 mv squared. Again, we can figure out that final speed, right? So just a little review there, a little bit of review um, for, uh, for as we go through and as we, we look at this. Cool. The second part is our deflection fields. And in particular, if I'm looking at my electric field for this, so remember, I've got an electron that is entering, oops, that was supposed to be that, but whatever, it's entering these deflection fields. So it looks like the positive plate is up top and the negative plate is on the bottom. Well, this is gonna go into parabolic motion and it's going to deflect upwards. Right? And we could also get into detail about this. We could talk about the uh, horizontal motion is uniform, the vertical motion is, uh, is accelerated, and then actually the Vertical, if we go back to physics principle one over here, pretty much tells us all we need to know for that one, right? So all of this, all of these ideas are going to be exactly the same when we're just talking about it, except horizontal is going to be uniform, and again, vertical is those ideas. Cool. Long story short, it's deflected up. So if I only have the magnetic field, we'd see our electrons hitting that phosphorus plate, or sorry, phosphorescent plate up there. I think I'm screwing up my terms. Fluorescent plate. <clears throat> the uh, other deflection field that we look at here is our magnetic field. And we can use our hand rules to predict which direction the magnetic field is going. So if I'm telling you the electrons are going that way, around the solenoids, around the coil of wires, we could figure out which direction the magnetic field in between them is. And then we could figure out which direction the electron is going to be deflected. So I just put the video on pause and got out the two hand rules that I needed. The first hand rule, and I would recommend you do the same. So put your video on pause, get out your two hand rules. The first one that I'm going to need is, back to the old felt pens here, left hand rule number. So it's for a solenoid. I'm hoping you're thinking number two. Right, okay, so left hand rule number two. So it looks like the electrons are flowing around this way. My curled fingers need to match that, and then my thumb is going to point in the direction of the magnetic field. So here's left hand rule number two. Let's just make that a little bit bigger. Let's rotate it so that my fingers are curling around. Back to the felt pen. Fingers are curling around the same direction that electrons are curling around the solenoid, and then what's the only direction that my thumb can point? Into the page, into the page. So let's just shrink that one way, way, way down, because I think we're done with hand rule number two, because we now know that the magnetic field everywhere inside of this solenoid is into the page. Now I've got an electron moving in an external magnetic field, we know that this is going to go into circular motion, and hopefully we're thinking left hand rule, hand rule number three for this. So get out left hand rule number three. Not at all what I wanted to do. Okay, let me get mine out. Let me make it a little bit bigger so we can actually see this one. So here's my left hand. Let's see, my magnetic field, that's my fingers, have to be pointed into the page. So notice my fingers, any way you look at it, Fingers are always pointed into the page. Perfect. The velocity, which is my thumb, has to be going towards the right. So that means to make it match, my hand has to be lined up like this. The only direction that I could have on this electro... Oops, not at all what I wanted to do. Undo that one. Scroll back up. The only direction for the uh, my palm to point is downwards. That's the direction of the magnetic force initially on this. So if... You know what? We're getting messy. Let's just go to the next one. If the uh, only force that's acting on it is, <coughs> excuse me, my magnetic force, it's going to go into uniform circular motion for a part of its motion, uh, just while it's in the deflection fields, and it would show up at location X. Perfect. Okay, so doesn't really explain how we figured out the properties, in particular the charge to mass ratio of an electron, but... Uh, but it's a start, right? Understanding the different parts of this. So, two steps to figure out the charge to mass ratio. First, run those electrons through 
with no deflection whatsoever. So both the electric field and the magnetic field are there. They're both turned on, but with no deflection. So if they're both turned on and there's no deflection, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us, let's see if I can get that nice felt pen back again. It tells us that we're dealing with physics principle zero. No deflection means vertically there's no overall net force acting on it, which means that the electric force must be balanced with the magnetic force. So we can expand on this, right? Electric force is electric field times charge. And magnetic force on a moving particle is QVB. Awesome. One issue that we you think we might run into is Thompson didn't know the charge of an electron. That came later with Millikan, but check it out. Thompson didn't actually need to know the charge of an electron. So what Thompson does with this is he very accurately figures out the speed of those electrons that are passing through. So you need to be able to create that form. That is not one that is on your data sheet. Uh, easy enough to create, but you do need to, and you will need to create it while you're doing your practice and stuff. Cool. So accurately figure out the speed of the electrons that are passing through undeflected. The second step is to turn the electric field off entirely and only have the magnetic field whatsoever. So only magnetic field. And we already know that it goes into circular motion. We've already talked about how we can, whoops, that's a funny looking hand. Uh, we've already talked about how uh, we know it's going to deflect downwards based on Hand rule number two, eventually, or sorry, number three. Eventually, I got there. And the math that we look at for this is well, FC, that's the same thing as net force, it's mass times acceleration. It's the sum of all forces. Well, in this case, the only force that's there now is our magnetic force. So we can expand on this. It's M times AC is equal to FM. I'll expand on that one in a second. AC, remember, is V squared divided by R. So that's MV squared divided by R is equal to Q V B. Nice, again, we see a little thing cancel, one of the speeds here, one of the speeds there. We still need to know what that speed is. Now the charge to mass ratio is what Millikan was looking for. So charge to mass ratio, that means we're looking for Q over M. So how much charge per unit mass these electrons have. So if I wanted to rearrange this for Q over M, it's gonna be V over R B is equal to Q over M. So I did, I left Q where it was, brought M down, brought, nope, left R where it was, and brought B down. There we go. Kind of made a little bit of a mistake there. So Q over M, that's the charge to mass ratio. How much charge is in a single unit of mass for an electron is equal to the speed divided by the radius, divided by the magnetic field, and Thompson was able to figure this out which is awesome, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, again, you need to be able to derive these formulas, like questions might ask, oh, what's the charge to mass ratio of this? Or what's the charge to mass ratio of that? Uh, keep in mind, charge to mass ratio, just look for Q over M, Q over M. Now, <coughs> excuse me, knowing the values for the speed, which we figured out in step one, the magnetic field, fairly easy to uh, figure out, and the radius, super easy to measure, uh, he was able to determine that the charge to mass ratio for an electron is 1.76 times 10 to the power of 11 coulombs per kilogram. That sounds like a ridiculously large number because we know that one coulomb of charge is a ridiculously large number from unit two, but we're talking about a kilogram a whole kilogram of just electrons, obviously it's gonna have a mass of charge. So 1.6 times 10 to the power of 11 coulombs per kilogram. Very, very cool, very cool. So Thompson in his time was able to determine this, the charge to mass ratio. Doesn't seem that awesome, but it is, trust me, it is, it is. Millikan is what we jump into for the next part. So you remember that Millikan figured out the charge of an electron, right? He used this device, the atomizer, the charged oil droplets, the suspended oil droplets, where we had the uh, force of gravity pulling them downwards and the electric force holding them upwards. We could draw a little free body diagram of that, why not? Force of gravity, 
force electric and he was able to go through and figure out the charge of a single oil droplet you probably remember from this the charge of every oil droplet he found had this particular pattern where 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs was the smallest charge and every other charge he found was a whole number multiple of that which would lead a person to believe the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Cool, so if we have the charge to mass ratio, which hopefully some of you are already starting to think about this, look at those units, we could use that as a conversion factor, and we also have the charge of an electron. We can combine these two things to figure out the mass of an electron, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 as our accepted value. Awesome. That is just spectacular. That is like the coolest thing. So small, you'd never be able to measure that, right? You'd never even be able to hold an electron still so that you could measure that. But these two figured it out. Pretty genius. Okay, let's do a quick example with this just to be sure it's it's hitting home. So a particle has a charge to mass ratio of 7.83 times 10 to the power of 10 coulombs per kilogram. If the particle has four electrons in excess, determine its mass. So first off, I'd probably want to go through and I'd say, okay, well, Q is equal to NE. Can we solve for the charge? Absolutely. So N is four electrons, and that's an excess. So we know it's going to be negative four times our elementary charge, 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. I don't know why I put coulombs outside of the bracket. That really didn't make any sense. Let's fix that. There we go. Uh, so take a second. What is our charge for this one? I'm going to plug this into the old calculator here. So 4 times 1.6 should be 6.4 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Nice. Second step is I'm going to use my charge to mass ratio as a conversion factor. So I've got 6.4 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And I'm going to multiply this by a conversion factor so that coulombs cancel, and I'm left with kilograms. So let's see. It is 7.83 times 10 to the power of 10 coulombs for every 1 kilogram. So the 1 goes with the kilogram. So 7.83 times 10 to the power of 10 coulombs obviously goes with the coulombs. And when you go ahead and plug that in, it should work out to be 8.17 times 10 to the negative 30 kilograms. Cool, so I like using this as a conversion factor, but do you necessarily need to use this as a conversion factor? I mean, no, you could also say 7.83 times 10 to the power of 10 is equal to Q over M, and now you kind of got a formula, rearrange and solve for M. Right, so it'll give you the same thing. I really like conversion factor. That's what makes me happy. But uh, yeah, cool. So we know how we found the mass of an electron now. It doesn't seem that exciting, but at the same time, that's, that's amazing. That's a really cool thing. Okay, last example that we've got here today is just, uh, just to show us, well, we don't have to use the Millikan-Thompson experiment to figure out the charge to mass ratio. All we need when we're trying to figure out the charge to mass ratio is Q over M. So if we can solve for Q over M, we found the charge to mass ratio. So let's check this out. We've got a parallel plate apparatus where a charge is accelerated from rest across a potential difference of 1200 volts and ends up leaving with a speed of 2.9 times 10 to the power of 6 meters per second. Automatically when I see this, I think physics principle 1 and physics principle 5. Physics principle one I know is out of the question because we don't have things like distance across the parallel plates. We don't have time. We don't have anything like that. So I think physics principle five is where it's at. So let's start to see. We're just going to expand on this realistically. Let's start to see if we can find Q over M by expanding. So initially, we must have electric potential energy. You know how I must have electric potential energy? There's no other way that it could start from rest and end up going really fast unless it had some type of energy here. Gravitational is not going to work. Spring, no, there's no springs there. So it's got to be my electric potential energy that I'm starting with. And that's going to end up with kinetic energy as it leaves. By the way, 
what's the charge on Q? Is it positive or negative? Must be a positive charge, right? Because it's next to the positive plate, has high potential energy. Must be positive. Not part of the question, but still something we should understand. So our electric potential energy is delta V times Q. Our kinetic energy is 0.5 mV squared. Don't get voltage confused with speed. We're looking for Q over M, hey? Can we re rearrange this for Q over M? You betcha we can. So Q over m, that's our charge to mass ratio, is going to be equal to 0.5 v squared divided by our voltage. That's not so bad. It's not so bad at all, realistically. Cool. So all we got to do is plug in some numbers here. So 0.5 times 2.9 times 10 to the power of 6 meters per second course we want to square that and then we're going to divide that by 1200 volts we saw some pretty big numbers before we're definitely going to see some pretty big numbers here again take a second to plug that into your calculator i ended up with 3.5 times 10 to the power of 9 coulombs per kilogram. Cool. Yeah, so Q over M, charge to mass ratio, like literally, just solve for Q over M, right? You're not solving for one or the other, not Q or for M. You're solving for Q divided by M. Um, so not too bad, I hope. Anyways, that's that's the lesson. I, I hope you enjoyed that. That is just something else, right? Solving for the mass of a single electron. That's wild. That is cool. That's it for now, Physics 30s. We will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.